Hey everybody, in today's video, I'm gonna show you how much data you actually need for a clean image. This is a question I've asked myself a lot over the years and I finally have some data to show you what to do and at what point you're gonna see diminishing returns. Because we've all seen those amazing photos of people that have captured 100 plus hours of data and while those images are great, if you're like me, you start to think, well, if I wanna get that much data, it's probably gonna take me an entire year because I have to go out during the new moon to a dark sky location with all my gear. And even then there's a chance it's gonna be cloudy. So to get 120 plus hours of data, that's a big commitment for ultimately one photo. As you'll see today though, you don't need to get quite that much data for a nice image. And I'll explain all the math behind this. I'll show you some sample images I've taken. And I think by the end of the video, you'll have a very clear idea of what you need to do. The first thing to understand is stops. A stop is a measurement of light we use in photography. If you add a stop, you've doubled the amount of light. If you subtract a stop, you've cut the amount of light in half. And this is very easy when we apply it to your shutter speed or in our case, our total exposure time because we're just doubling numbers at that point. For example, if I get one hour of data and my photo is very grainy, I can add a stop by capturing two hours of data. Then I can increase that to four hours for another stop. If I wanna get another stop of light, I have to go all the way up to eight hours though then 16, 32, 64, and then we have 128 hours. And at that point, you might as well call it quits because another stop would be 256 hours of data. And this is probably the most important thing I can convey to you in this entire video, is that if your photos are grainy, you need to add a stop of light, if not two or three stops of light. So if your photo is grainy at four hours, you need at least eight or 16 hours, maybe even 32 hours to get a noticeable improvement. That's all there is to it when it comes down to the math of astrophotography. Another way to say that is if you have 32 hours of data and your photo is still grainy, getting an extra 30 minutes here or even three or four hours there is not gonna have a noticeable impact. You need to double your total exposure time, in this case to 64 hours now. Now that we're starting to understand stops in regards to the exposure length, let's switch gears and talk about stops in regards to your aperture. And in fact, this will have a much bigger impact on your final image. Now, the numbers here don't make a lot of sense. You just have to memorize them. Unless you've been doing photography, you should know these. But if we look at our chart here, f2 is considered a very wide open aperture. It lets in a lot of light. If we go down to f2.8, we've lost a stop of light. We've cut it in half. Then we go down to f4, we've lost half the amount of light again. f4 to f5.6 is another stop lost of light. F5.6 to F8, F8 to F11. And most telescopes are usually at worst around F11, so we're gonna stop there. I realize these numbers might be a bit confusing if you're new to this idea, so you might wanna take a screenshot and refer back to this later. But here's a great demonstration that will drive home this point. Let's say I have my ASCAR-V telescope in the 600 millimeter configuration, and the aperture is, let's just say F8 for today. It's F7.5, close enough. So we've got an F8 rig right here, and then we've got, let's say, the Raza telescope, which is F2. And if we put both of these setups side by side one night and aim up at a target for one hour, and we compare the photos, here's what we're gonna see. Let's just do some quick math here. If we go from F8 to F5.6, we've added one stop of light. It's twice as bright. If we go from F5.6 to F4, that's two stops or four times as much light. F4 to F2.8, that's three stops or eight times as much light. And finally, if we go from F2.8 to F2 with the Raza, that's 16, 16 times, times the detail, detail with the Raza compared to the Ascar V. Another way to say this is if you took both setups and aimed up at the same target, it would take 16 hours with the Ascar to match one hour with the Raza. This is one reason why the Raza has been so popular over the years, because you get a ton of light in a short amount of time. And at this point, I know some of you are thinking, well, hold on a minute. Just because a telescope has a wider aperture doesn't necessarily mean it's better. For example, my Red Cat 51, that has an f4.9 aperture. So that kind of puts it right between f4 and f5.6. However, the actual opening of that telescope is only 51 millimeters. It's probably that big around. But some of you might have a Celestron Edge, 11 inch, for example. That's F10. And that telescope is huge. It weighs a lot, it's expensive, and it's probably that big around. So you might be thinking, how can that giant telescope let in less light 
than a red cat. That makes no sense. And this opens up a whole other can of worms I didn't want to get into, but I thought it'd be at least important to touch on it today. The reason that Celestron has an F10 aperture is due to its focal length, which is about, I think, let's see here, 2800 millimeters, whereas the red cat is only 250 millimeters. That means the Celestron has over 10 times as much zoom. And so the aperture does take the focal length into consideration. But there is a really cool adapter you can get for the Celestron. It's called the Hyperstar from Star Arizona. I've never used one, but as it says here on the website, you can attach this to the back of your telescope, in this case, the Celestron 11 inch, and it's gonna take that F10 aperture and increase it all the way to about F2. That's 25 times more light than it had originally. And the way it does that is it cuts down on the focal length. We go from 2800 millimeters to about 540 millimeters. And now you basically have a Raza at that point. So I hope this concept makes a bit more sense now. Even though the Celestron is F10, it has that giant light gathering capability. And if you put a Star Arizona adapter on there, like the Hyperstar, you can make the full use out of that telescope, although you will be sacrificing your focal length. So when it comes to your aperture and astrophotography, size does matter. The trouble is that a larger telescope is obviously bigger, heavier, harder to use, and it's gonna cost a lot more than something like a Red Cat would. Okay, before we move on, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. If you want a cleaner photo, you have to double your total exposure time. If you have four hours of data, try to get eight hours of data total. If the photo is still grainy, try to get 16 hours of data total, then 32, etc. Or if you just don't get that many clear nights, consider investing in a telescope with a larger aperture. And now you can get much more data in the same amount of time. Alternatively, you could buy two identical setups, maybe two ASCAR Vs, two 2600 color cameras, two AM5s, and then if you set those out on the same night and capture the same target, then obviously you're gonna double the amount of data you capture on any given night. But now that you understand the math behind this concept, let's take a look at some of the actual photos I've captured and we'll see the difference up close. Welcome back to the video. We're now gonna go through and take a look at some of the data I've captured on a few different targets. We've got the Crescent Nebula, the Elephant's Trunk, Iris, Orion, and the Pleiades for our comparisons today. Just a quick note, what I did for these photos is I went through and I stacked them all in PixInsight. I started with just an hour's worth of data, then I increased it to two hours of data for this particular image. Then four hours, eight hours, and 16 hours. And for all of these photos, I ran SPCC to fix the color cast. I did a simple auto stretch with the screen transfer function tool. And then I ran star exterminator so we can actually see the data better. And this will give us a very good idea of the differences as we add a stop of light each time. Or in other words, we double our total exposure length. Let's start off with the Crescent Nebula because this is actually the most data I've ever gathered on an image, upwards of 20 hours, although I only included 16 today. And from back here, one hour of data, you can actually see everything in the photo. We have the Crescent Nebula, these H-alpha clouds, and it looks pretty cool. But it's lacking definition and detail. If I double the exposure time to two hours, there's a noticeable improvement. If I double that again to four hours, Again, another noticeable improvement. Then to eight hours, there's a decent improvement there. And then 16, it's starting to get a bit more subtle. We're seeing those diminishing returns. And really the main areas you're gonna see additional data are in the background sky, like right here. If we go to one hour, it's just completely covered up with noise and we're missing out on the finer details. If we go to two hours though, we can resolve a bit more. Four hours, eight hours, 16. And we would see a similar jump in quality if we went up to 32 hours. Again, the main takeaway from all this is that you need to double your total exposure time to get a noticeable improvement. If you're just gathering an extra two or three hours here and there, especially once you have at least 16 hours, you're not really going to see much of an improvement. Also, check out down here in the corner. At 16 hours, there's some fun stuff to look at. If we go to eight though, it gets a bit more grainy. Four, two, and one hour. Just a night and day difference there. That's why you want more exposure time. And if we look at the crescent itself, right in here we have this nice little wisp. That's 16 hours of data compared to one hour of data. The wisp is still there, you can see it, it's just lacking 
uh, some more detail. So there we have 2, 4, 8, 16. Another thing I really struggled with editing this photo is this kind of like blue band right here. At one hour, it's almost completely covered up by color noise. At two hours, there's something there. At four, now we're getting some definition. And then at eight, it cleans up. 16, it's a little bit cleaner. So for me, the main takeaway from this image is that you can totally get a usable photo at one hour as long as you don't try to process it too far. This is something we touched on, but if I really start to increase the contrast, the image is gonna fall apart and the color noise just becomes way worse and it's just not very fun to look at. But if we look at the 16 hour version, that looks way better and it's not nearly as noisy now. So that's why you want a lot more data if you're gonna really start to play with the photo. It just holds up much better. Let's take a look at another comparison. Why don't we do Iris next? At one hour, I mean, there's some dust there, but it's just kind of hard to see. At two hours, noticeably better, four, and then eight. Eight hours looks good, but having seen the 16 hours for the Crescent Nebula, I'd like to get at least 16, maybe even more hours of data on Iris. Again, from back here, there's one hour versus eight hours. And if I add some vibrance and contrast to the photo, that might help to show the difference better. There's one hour, just really grainy. Then we have two hours, four, and eight. Let's move on to the Pleiades next. This is a really fun target in the winter. We have a bit of a gradient here because I was shooting low on the horizon. And this is only 30 minutes now because I maxed out at four hours, so I dropped it down one stop to 30 minutes. Again, if you're not sure, just cut your number in half or double it, that's a stop, so pretty easy to do. Anyway, we have 30 minutes compared to one hour, two hours, and then four hours. At four hours, we can now make out a lot of this incredible dust here in the sky, which you wouldn't even know is there in 30 minutes. I mean, you can kind of tell, but nothing like four hours. And I can only imagine how great this would look with eight or 16 hours worth of data. But for most people, you know, if you're out there in a dark sky, even upwards of two hours is enough to start bringing out those finer details. I wanna take a quick break from the photos real quick and explain two other things. The difference between a color camera and a monochrome camera and how light pollution will affect your images. Unfortunately, I don't have enough data to clearly show these differences, but what I will say is that if you have more light pollution, that reduces the contrast of your nebula or galaxy. And as you've already seen in some of these images, as we push the data further, it begins to look worse. The grain appears more obvious, there's more color noise, and the image just starts to fall apart. The point being here that if you are shooting from a light polluted area, you're gonna make things much more difficult for yourself. And if you just got out to a darker sky, that would add contrast to your objects automatically and actually give you a cleaner photo at the end of the day. But because I don't have enough comparison images, I'd recommend you do your own research in regards to how light pollution will affect the grain and the overall quality of your photos. This would also apply to the moon as well. If the full moon is out, that's gonna add complications, not to mention gradients to your photos in some cases. The other thing I want to touch on was the difference between monochrome and color. This is something else I would like to test in the future, but that would take months to gather the data I need, so we'll have to save that for a separate video. But basically, the way we want to think about it is, if you capture images with a one-shot color camera for, let's say, two hours, you're technically getting two hours of data on your red, green, and blue color channels. But if you had a monochrome camera and you want to get two hours of red, green, and blue data, that would take six hours total, because you can only do one filter at a time. And the question is, how much better would that monochrome image look than the color? Like I said, unfortunately I don't have enough data to share with you yet. I'd recommend you do your own research, but that would be something else to consider. We're back again here on the computer. Now we're looking at the Orion Nebula. And because this target is so bright, you would think you don't need that much data. But the real fun of this target is the dust here in the background. And even at 30 minutes, the dust is visible to some degree. And if I add some curves and vibrance, that will help to showcase that dust. But there's 30 minutes compared to one hour. That's a big jump, right? Then we go to two hours. That's a noticeable improvement as well. Four hours, now this is starting to look really cool. We even have the horse head nebula over here, part of it anyway. And that red light is bouncing off the clouds. Check this out. You can see that here in the background. It's just so fun to do this kind of deep space astrophotography from a dark sky 
and get enough data to showcase the stunning beauty there in the background that most people aren't even aware of. Like we have this blue light up here. At 30 minutes, I mean, you could see it, but it's kind of just lost in the noise. Even one hour is enough to start to bring it out better. But as we're starting to see, once we get upwards of four, eight, 16 hours, that's really the sweet spot for a lot of these targets. And I should have mentioned this sooner, but for this particular photo, I was using the Red Cat 51 telescope and the ASI 2600 Duo camera. But based on what we're seeing here, I think four hours is a great target window if you can get to that dark sky with a telescope around f5.6 roughly. If you had an f8 telescope though, to get this clean of a shot, you need about eight hours worth of data or even 16 hours in some cases. For me though, one of the coolest parts of this photo is actually right in here. I never really even noticed this stuff before, but now that I'm getting enough data, even just four hours, it starts to look really nice compared to two hours, one hour, and then just 30 minutes. It's just getting lost there in the grain. I should also mention that I will have these saved as JPEGs if you want to take a look up close. That'll be available for the channel members in the community tab. If you're not a member yet, you can always join at any time and check that out. Okay, let's move on now. And we have the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. This is a pretty big and bright target though, which makes it pretty good if you don't have a lot of time. For example, if I zoom in here, even at just one hour of data, it looks pretty good. If we jump that up to two hours, four, and then about seven and a half, it's noticeably cleaner though, compared to just one hour. But in this case, there's not as big of a change as we've been seeing with some of the other targets, just because this is a light emitting area compared to just a dark, dusty area over here. And really the best place you're gonna see this is down here at the bottom. We have all these really fun details poking out. At one hour, you can kind of see them. At two hours, they're much more defined. At four, and then about eight. Now they've cleaned up, and you can really start to make out the fainter details here, which at one hour, much more difficult to pick out. And if I add a curves layer and bump things up, that should make it even easier to see what we're talking about. So we have one, two, four, and about eight. But from back here anyway, it's hard to see the difference between one and eight hours. They look pretty good no matter how much data you have, honestly. And that's all I've got for you in terms of our comparison images today. We've seen a nice selection of the H Alpha Nebula, the dark dusty ones, of course, Orion. And I think what we've seen is if you can get out to a dark sky with a fairly wide open aperture around f5.6 roughly, you can get a great looking photo in just four hours. But if you're shooting through a lot of light pollution, you're shooting with an F8 or F10, even worse aperture, now you're gonna need eight or 16 hours or 32 hours to get a comparable photo. And of course, the more edits you do, the faster the image will fall apart. And after doing these tests myself, I'm starting to realize that for these dark, dusty nebula like this, I think 16 hours is a good target. If I can get 16 hours in O, I have a solid image. For the brighter nebula that have a lot of H alpha, you know, I could probably spend eight hours and be happy with it. I don't really need much more than that. And then for things like Orion that have a lot of dust, but also a bright nebula, again, I'd probably want eight to 16 hours for those as well. More data is always better if you can afford it. But in terms of Orion here, the brighter areas are gonna clean up a lot faster than the darker areas. So even at 30 minutes, it's not that bad. One hour, pretty clean. Two hours, there's almost no grain left. Four hours, virtually none. All right, well, I think this is giving you a pretty good idea of how much data you actually need. Like I said, if you wanna see these up close, be sure to check the community tab if you're a channel member, and I'll have all the JPEGs there available. And that's all I've got for you in today's video. I hope this showed you how much data you actually need for a clean photo. The big takeaway is that if you wanna improve the quality of your images, you need to double whatever total exposure time you have. So if you already have eight hours of data and the photo is still very grainy, try for 16 hours. If it's still grainy, try for 32 hours. But for me, at that point, you reach diminishing returns and trying to get 64 hours, good luck. So I think I'd probably just call it right around 32 if I had to. Alternatively, you can always buy a larger telescope with a bigger aperture. That will let more light into the camera and you can get more data in less time. Finally, don't forget that if you're shooting in a light polluted area, that will affect the amount of data you need and it will make things harder. So whenever possible, try to get out to a darker sky 
and that will make your life easier. But that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in another video.